So here in the connect to me request, the, the link request fails, for example, because A is a net that does not allow, a symmetric net that does not allow B to connect to it. And A and B will exchange their neighbor lists. Let's say that they decide on a proxy C. So A already has a connection to C, an edge to C. B creates an edge to C, and they set up this virtual edge from A to B through C. Another optimization uh, is the use of network coordinates. And here the goal is to avoid long latency physical delays when we have communication through a third party, like in the previous example. So out of the many possible nodes that could be candidates for being a proxy, we'll try to select one that we estimate to have the lowest bandwidth, uh, uh, sorry, the lowest latency between uh, the two endpoints we're trying to connect. And this builds upon related work uh, the Vivaldi network coordinate system, which essentially estimates through measurements between peer interactions, a coordinate space where each node essentially gets uh, an XY coordinate in this uh, virtual um, uh, uh, space of uh, network coordinates. And then we select nodes using latency estimates uh, to prioritize which nodes are being selected for tunneling. So in this example, maybe A, and B have possible several possible uh, neighbors to consider, and the nodes will compute uh, the distance through the proxy node between each other in this network coordinate space, and using that distance to prioritize which nodes they'll uh, establish an edge with. So let's say in, in this case, the Euclidean distance between A and C is smaller, uh, A, C, and B is smaller than A, D, B, then C will be chosen as the proxy node. Finally, another important optimization is overlay bypass. And here the goal is to avoid user kernel level crossing and user level processing altogether. Basically, the idea here is to detect that nodes that are within the same local area network are able to communicate with each other without going through uh, the user level router. So looking back at the IPOP design, as we've seen so far, we see a scenario where each node runs the IPOP router locally and has a local uh, virtual network interface, a uh, TAP interface. And then this IPOP local router is uh, responsible for capturing uh, address resolution protocol or ARP requests or DHCP requests and serve as a gateway to the IPOP overlay. Now to support uh, overlay bypass, we change, uh, expand on this architecture, allowing uh, the separation of the router from the virtual uh, machines that are running um, applications. So here we have a separate machine, a LAN router, that's running the IPOP code, and the applications connected to the virtual network actually do not run the router code, but they rack, they're bound, uh, they're connected to the router node through local area network links. And this approach still allows the original model where we have the entire virtual machine um, with the IPOP router, the application, the virtual network interface. <coughs> so how does this different model works? We have now in this block that I'm highlighting, the virtual router running the VPN software, IPOP, the TAP device, and this has two network interfaces, one connected to a local area network and one connected to the internet and to the rest of the overlay. Now machines that are connected to this local area network do not run this software and they're able to communicate with each other through the local area network switch. When they need to communicate with another machine that's outside this local area network, the packet is encapsulated and sent through the IPOP router. <coughs> so how do we handle the HCP requests uh, in this case? Uh, the approach is based on what we've seen uh, earlier. Essentially, a node sends a DHCP re request on the local area network, and now it is captured, this request, by the virtual router that's running in the same local area network. So it has to be capable to run as a DHCP server uh, within this local area network. But this request is taken again by IPOP, and it generates a random address, tries to put the address on the DHT like we've seen earlier, and eventually returns an IP address to the <coughs> node that requested a DHCP. 
uh, message. Uh, another important uh, protocol that we need to worry about is the address resolution protocol, which in Ethernet uh, map maps an IP address to a, a link layer Ethernet address. So what we need to uh, be careful here is that some of the machines that are uh, going to be on the local air network, we want to make sure that they are reply directly with their uh, data link layer address, with their MAC address of their network interfaces. Whereas if the uh, machine that you're trying to uh, look up a hardware address for belongs to um, the rest of the overlay that's outside this local area network, we would like to return the address of the virtual router so that it serves as a gateway for that uh, request. So if the request is for an IP address that matches a local area network, um, um, a machine in the local area network, that machine replies to the output request through the uh, switched Ethernet and the virtual router will ignore this request. Whereas if the request is for a machine that has an IP address of a machine that's in a remote um, network, the virtual router will use the DHT lookup process that we've seen earlier. We'll find that this machine is indeed part of the um, virtual network and will return with uh, the MAC address of the virtual router itself so that it becomes a gateway uh, for any time uh, this machine tries to send a packet to um, uh, this IP address, IP2, it goes through this gateway and into the IPOP overlay uh, for the destination on the other side of the uh, virtual network. So these are the uh, major uh, performance optimizations seen in IPOP, and in the next lecture we're going to discuss security implications.